<laughs> Thank you. So, <clears throat> um, so I will continue today um, uh, talking about divisors. So remember that last time we defined uh, veil divisors. Oh, veil divisors, even veil Q divisors. And uh, but we, I also explained that this is not some sense. This is not the right notion. You can do much more with Cartier divisors. <coughs> And uh, so you can go from Cartier divisor to uh, veil divisor, at least is the uh, variety is normal. And so I also uh, explained, so let's say, so let's forget about the Q here, because if you have a, uh, a, a true Cartier divisor integral D, you can associate to it uh, invertible sheaf. L. Next, which is uh, usually written as a, a wax of D. So uh, most of the time, I'll, I'll try to use the language of divisors more than uh, invertible sheaves. Uh, one reason for that is that we can. Uh, uh, it's easy to go from a divisor to a Q divisor, and <coughs> on this side, there's no such uh, analog. And uh, so uh, finally, I define a linear equivalence and a numerical equivalence. And I explained that uh, if you have a, a, a projective variety, for example, uh, over a field, then uh, the group of uh, Cartier divisors, uh, modulo numerical equivalence, is a free abelian group of finite rank. So uh, let me uh, ex uh, do uh, um, e examples. OK, so here I, I, I forgot to mention that this numerical equivalence is defined via the, uh, an intersection product between uh, Cartier divisors and curves on the variety. OK? And so uh, the example, uh, the first example is, is quite uh, uh, basic. It's the case of the projective space over, uh, over a field. And uh, so what happens here is that uh, the neon uh, group is not really uh, interesting. I mean, it is uh, isomorphic to uh, Z, and the isomorphism is given by uh, the degree. Okay, so here, uh, if I think of elements in here as uh, hypersurfaces in Pn, this is the degree as uh, hypersurfaces, so the degree of a, a defining equation. Uh, so if uh, I won't uh, go into the details, but what happens here is that this uh, intersection product, so uh, C is a curve. So in my, uh, I'm trying to think of a curve as a morphism from C to Pn. But uh, for this example, I'll, I'll think of it as uh, embedded in Pn, OK? <laughs> or, or at least, say, one uh, bar rational on, onto its image. Okay? And in this case, this intersection product is simply the product of the degrees. OK, so the degree of D, I explain what it is. It is given by this uh, morphism here times the, the degree of C, or let's say degree of rho of C, if you want, to be more precise. OK, so this is what this product is here. So this is a, the degree as a curve in Pn, as defined in, a, in the first uh, chapter of Hartshorn, for example. So now let's do a, a more uh, instructive example which is the blow up of Pn at a point. So let's say that Pn uh, k tilde. So this is the blow up of a point. OK, so uh, one way to describe this blow up is uh, as follows. Uh, you look at the set of pairs of uh, um, points x, y, so x is in Pn. And actually, so what I do here, there are several ways to describe this. And uh, so what I do is, is choose a hyperplane uh, in Pn, which is, uh, does not pass through uh, the, point that, the point that you're blowing up. Okay, so here x is, would be in Pn and y would be in uh, H0. And uh, you want uh, x to be 
on the line O Y. Okay, so this is the line the line span by O and Y. So something like this. Okay, in some sense, this uh, hyperplane here parameterizes in a more interesting way um, lines through uh, O. Okay, and so epsilon in that case is the first projection, and so we see that. Uh, what the um, blow up does is replace the point O by a PN minus 1, which is here uh, this H naught. Okay? So epsilon induces, um, so epsilon inverse of 0. So if uh, X is, I mean, uh, not 0, O, uh, if X is O, then any point uh, in H0 will be in the variety. So this is isomorphic to H naught. Okay, and this is, uh, this is called the exceptional divisor of the blow-up, so usually uh, denoted by E. And so epsilon uh, induces an isomorphism uh, between the complement of E and uh, the uh, complement of O. Okay, so let's try to use this to uh, determine the uh, neuron cellular uh, group of uh, the blow-up. So now I'm, I'm going to use uh, 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 some results which I won't prove. So the thing is that, uh, so let's, uh, we assume here that N is uh, at least two, otherwise this is sort of an empty discussion. And uh, so what we have is, uh, is the following. So uh, Picard group or neon Sevry is the same here for this uh, in this example. So this one we know. I just explained that it's this is Z. This is the same as uh, Picard of uh, P. Huh? And here we have a restriction to the complement of uh, of the point that you're blowing up, and this is subjective. So in terms of divisors, you're just taking a divisor and you restrict it here. Okay, and uh, you can see this is an isomorphism between because uh, n is at least two, so whenever you have a divisor here, you can lift it up. Um, no, sorry, if you have a divisor uh, which is actually uh, um, uh, linearly equivalent in here, uh, no, sorry, if you have a divisor here uh, whose restriction to this uh, open set here is uh, linearly equivalent to zero, then it is already uh, linearly equivalent to zero. So this is. An isomorphism, and uh, this is because Pn is smooth, and uh, the, the thing that you're taking off as the codimension at least two. So let's write the uh, analogous. There's not a lot of room here. Uh, sequence upstairs. So now I'm taking off the uh, the divisor E. And there's a map here, which, is, uh, which I define as time, which is uh, the pullback by epsilon. Okay. And then there's a, it's, a standard, it's a standard general fact that uh, so this uh, sequence in, in, uh, in general is not, this map here is not in general injective. It has a kernel, which is, uh, which is the image of the map, so sorry, let me give a name to this map and write it here. So the map alpha maps an integer m to the class of me. Okay. So uh, let me compute some uh, intersection products because uh, this is the uh, first example where we can do something uh, non-trivial. So uh, let me draw a picture here. So this is E, the exceptional divisor. This is the blown up variety. Okay, and uh, so this is the point that you're blowing up. This is Pn. And this is the blow up map. And so we take a line which is contained in the exceptional divisor. This is isomorphic to Pn minus one. So uh, taking a line here uh, makes sense. And uh, so what I want here is to compute the intersection EL. Okay, so this is a case where uh, the uh, counting the number of intersection points doesn't work because L is contained in E. Okay, so we have to do uh, something a little bit different. 
So let, let me take a, another, a hyperplane in here, H, which does not, does not pass through uh, the point O. And then we see that, uh, so epsilon upper star of H is uh, something which is uh, disjoint from E. So in particular, its intersection number with L is zero. Okay, so maybe I forgot to mention that last time, but it's a, it's a trivial point that if the uh, C does not meet, I think I mentioned it, C does not meet the support of D, this intersection number is zero. Okay, so we have this. So now, this uh, intersection number only depends on the numerical equivalence class of H. So we can take uh, another hyperplane H. So let me take a uh, hyperplane which now passes through O. So one can check, uh, so let me call this H prime, one can check that the inverse image of uh, H prime is the sum of two divisors. First of all, there is E, because, uh, so the inverse image uh, contains the inverse image of O, which is E. And then there's another, mm, let me write it, uh, keep this one. It's not the same H, but they are uh, numerically, or linearly equivalent. And uh, let me call here, what we have here, is what, uh, what is called the strict transform of uh, this new H here, which is a uh, uh, something uh, H prime. So the, uh, <laughs> the picture is not, it's, it's a bit difficult to draw. The intersection of H prime with E is a hyperplane. Okay, so you can check that by local calculations. Okay, so the intersection of those two The hyperplane in E okay. so now let me compute this uh, intersection number using this other hyperplane okay so we'll still have zero and what uh, what this is saying is that uh, this is the zero should also be the intersection number of these guys here so this is a um, uh, there is a, a bilinear, right? Uh, it's bilinear here. And here we, we have h prime dot l. Okay. But we see that h prime and l actually meet in exactly one point and transversely. Okay. So this intersection number in that case is just one. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Plus one. Okay, so this is one. So in the end, we see that this number we were looking for is uh, minus one. Okay. And uh, so this will be useful uh, later on, but it also proves that this map here is uh, injective, okay, because uh, the image. I mean, Me cannot, can never be zero because Me dot L is minus M. So this map here is injective. So we have the uh, determined here, uh, the Picard group of uh, the blow up, and it has uh, rank two. The Picard number is two. So the conclusion is that the Picard number of uh, the blow-up, I mean the Picard group of the blow-up is isomorphic to, as an abelian group, one uh, factor z generated by the class of E plus, uh, let's say, the pullback of the Picard group of uh, of Pn, which I'll write uh, this way. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll go back to this example uh, later on. So, uh, why are we interested in uh, these divisors? Well, the main reason is the something which has appeared uh, already many times. So why do we care about divisors?
divisors or invertible sheaves. Well, they, the reason the, uh, is that there's a very uh, a very intimate relationship between uh, divisors, uh, invertible sheaves on X, and morphism to the projective space. Okay, so this was uh, already used in <coughs> other talks many times. So, for example, assume that you have a, a morphism from your variety X, which are assumed to be Q projective normal. Okay, so assume that, that you have a morphism like this to some projective space. Well, so this is something that uh, you probably, uh, probably know. Uh, to this situation, we can associate a line bundle, I mean, a invertible sheaf, which is the pullback of the O of 1 in here. So let me call that L. Okay, so there's a whole uh, gymnastics uh, uh, I mean, you look at uh, what's, what's going on. I won't do it on the blackboard because uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's very easy. It's actually in the notes. And so uh, one way to uh, describe this uh, correspondence between a morphism to the projective space and uh, this uh, thing here is the following. Uh, this uh, situation, uh, so not only gives you uh, invertible sheave on X, but also a space of sections. And one way to do it, in, uh, this is not the best way, but this is the, uh, um, it's easier to write down. Uh, this morphism in descri is described as follows. It sends X to uh, S not of X, S N of X, where Uh, so S naught, S N are uh, sections of L. And uh, so this, this is a bit strange because I mean S, S, S naught of X is not, uh, it's not uh, an element of K, right? But so the way to do it correctly is, is to choose an open set over which L is trivial and once you've tri trivialized L, then this makes sense, okay? And then you check that on various trivializations, then it gives, uh, this makes sense. This is because if you change the trivialization, uh, all these uh, section, I mean, all these uh, uh, scalars here will be multiplied by the same non-zero number, okay? So uh, this is one thing. And uh, so this, this very simple correspondence uh, it sets up, uh, a bijection between uh, morphism from uh, X to projective space and uh, invertible sheaves on X plus uh, subspace of sections, okay? So the subspace is the subspace spanned by S, S not SN, okay? Uh, here it looks like I have to, ch uh, to choose a basis, but this is because I didn't do the things in an intrinsic way. You can do it, okay? There's one thing which I didn't mention here is that for this formula to make sense, uh, the sections cannot vanish all at the same point, okay? So uh, the, the real correspondence, uh, the way to set it in a better way than this is, is that there's a, a correspondence between this situation and uh, invertible sheaf L on X plus a, a subspace of sections with no uh, base point. Okay, so this is, so it means exactly that uh, the, the sections of this subspace do not all vanish at the same point. So in particular, if, uh, So another way to uh, state this uh, base point freeness is in fancier terms, I mean exactly the same, 
you want to say that, uh, let's, so let me give a name V uh, to the subspace here. Uh, in uh, sheath theoretic terms, it means that if you look at the evaluation map that was mentioned also um, in uh, uh, Gabby's talk yesterday, if you look at this evaluation map here, it means exactly that this map here is subjective. This is equivalent. So base point freeness, BPF, means exactly that this map here is subjective. Okay. Because the co-kernel of this uh, map is supported on the set of points where uh, all these sections vanish. Okay? And uh, so now, uh, one natural choice given L is to choose for V the whole space of sections here. So the, uh, a very uh, important definition is that we say that L is globally generated. If the evaluation map taken on the whole space of sections is subjective. And why is it important to have a, a globally generated uh, invertible sheaves? Is, oh, it's, this is because of this correspondence. Once you have uh, this situation here, you can define a morphism. Then one has a morphism uh, uh, from X to uh, projective space. If you want to be intrinsic, actually, the space you want to write here is uh, this one. Of course, this depends on your convention uh, for projective space. I think uh, Gabby had the uh, French convention. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you can forget about this. Uh, this, is, this is nothing more than the correspondence that, that was there. Uh, in, in case there are, uh, there are base points, you can still define uh, a map, but it's, it's going to be only a rational map. Okay? So let me not go into this. So it is important to have uh, globally generated sheaves to uh, know the maps from your variety to uh, the protective space. And so this is sort of a justification uh, for... Uh, the next definition. So in some sense, uh, if you, th this condition here on L is very uh, restrictive and not, does not behave so well. And it's better, uh, you may also want to uh, impose the fact that some uh, tensor power of L has this property. And then, uh, uh, I mean, all this leads to this following definition here that you probably know of uh, what is a, a ample divisor. So this is a, the most important definition um, that <laughs> I've given yet. So we say that, uh, so x, so let me, I think I want to be, uh, you want x, x would be a, a, a scheme of finite type over a field. But don't pay any attention to that. So we say that a, divi a, D, a Cartier divisor on X is ample if for any coherent sheaf F on X, so F of MD, so this is a standard notation for the tensor product of F with the uh, invertible sheaf OX of MD. So this is a notation. Uh, if for any coherent sheaf F of X, this sheaf here is globally generated for all M so m is an integer here, uh, large enough. So here I'm talking about a, a globally generated sheaf. The definition is exactly this one. 
Okay? In this definition, you, nobody, you don't need L to be invertible. Okay? So you just copy this definition. So there are lots of uh, basic results about uh, ample uh, divisors. Uh, I don't think I will uh, start proving them because it's pretty uh, classical. I mean, it, they were proved by many by Serre, I guess. A faisceau algebraic coherent in the uh, beginning of the 50s. He was uh, barely 25 years old, I think. <laughs> Something like that. He's 19 now and still uh, doing very well. Um, so uh, the proofs that I need are in the notes. And they're not very complicated. And so the first thing that is very easy to prove is that D is ample. So this you can do as an exercise if you've never seen that before. If and only if, uh, uh, now I need another uh, number. Well, uh, MD is ample for some, or actually all, uh, positive integer m. Okay. So in particular, there's something which is very stable by a multiplication by a positive integer, and that's very good for uh, defining ampleness for Q divisors. Okay. So this allows you to define ample Q divisors. Okay. You take a Q div a Cartier Q divisor. And uh, so you, you, f you first take a, um, a multiple, which is a, a true, ca I mean, uh, 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 integral Cartier divisor, and you uh, require it to be ample. And this does not depend on the uh, uh, choices you, ma you make. So, uh, let me see. So let me make a list of uh, the properties of uh, ample divisors that uh, I'll need. So first of all, and, and some, I mean, most of them are very easy to check. So ample plus ample is ample. <coughs> ample plus globally generators is also ample. So GG means globally generated. Ample does not imply globally generated. Ample implies that some multiple, if you apply this to uh, f equals ox, some multiple is globally generated. But uh, an ample divisor may have no sections at all, no non-zero sections. Um, OK. So let me show you, uh, prove at least something. So x is uh, as before. And so assume that A is ample, so Q divisor, ample Q divisor. This actually doesn't, uh, I mean, the Q here is just uh, poudre aux yeux, as we say in French. It doesn't change anything. Uh, D, uh, any <coughs> Q divisor. <coughs> then, uh, a plus TD is ample for all Q, for all T uh, small enough. So, so this is one instance where it's nice to have the language of Q divisors because you can add a little bit of divisor. This would not be possible in, uh, if you didn't have the language of Q divisors. But, I mean, of course, what you could do here is uh, uh, translate the t in uh, 1 over t here and, and require it to be a large enough integer. But this is, uh, this is a nicer uh, statement. So uh, let me do the proof. So first of all, we can multiply everything so that a and d are actually uh, divisors. Okay, so we get rid of the q's here. And uh, since A is ample, uh, there exists an integer M such that MA plus D and MA minus D are globally gen generated uh, 
for, so for m, <coughs> you choose one m large enough. Okay, so this is the, comes from the definition of m upon s. And then you write uh, in a clever way what you want. So first of all, uh, using uh, this here, you see that m plus 1 a plus or minus d is ample. Okay, and then uh, so write a plus uh, or plus or minus uh, t d. So t is actually t is going to be any rational number between zero and one over m plus one. And so let me copy on my uh, paper, otherwise. Uh, plus or minus d. Okay, so this is, uh, this is trivial, right? This cancels out with this term here. So since this, uh, I've chosen t small enough, this is positive. So this is ample. And uh, this guy here is also ample. And since we're uh, multiplying it by a positive integer, uh, t times this is also ample, and the sum of two amples is ample. Okay, so this is the kind of, uh, this is just a trick, right? Okay, so this is nice, but uh, uh, we don't have any tool to, uh, where do you find ample devices? So this is uh, Sayre, Sayre's theorem, the main theorem. that uh, the uh, hyperplane on Pn is ample. Okay, so this sounds very specific. It's only on Pn. But, so something I forgot to mention in my list of properties here, so I can add it on the list. It comes from the fact that if you, if you have a, a coherent sheaf which is globally generated on X, it will also be globally generated on any subscheme. Okay? So uh, the restriction of an ample to a subscheme is ample. So in particular, Whenever you have a projective variety, x in Pn, then uh, the restriction of the hyperplane divisor to x will be ample. Okay. Okay. Um. So let me give you a, a corollary, which sounds uh, obvious. It, it is actually more or less obvious in the... Uh, with the uh, sort of framework that I've chosen, but uh, uh, it's not obvious uh, in general. Uh, okay, so uh, X, so the statement of this corollary is that any Cartier divisor on a projective variety Is the, is, a, is the difference of two effective Cartier divisors. So it may sound like a triviality because, I mean, the way I presented things, I always work with normal varieties. So wh what you want to do here is that you take your Cartier divisor you write it as a veil divisor, and then some uh, coefficients will be positive, some will be negative. Okay? 
But the problem here is that even if you put together the positive coefficients, uh, there's no reason why the veil divisor, that the positive veil divisor that you obtain is Cartier. Okay? So, mm, proof. If you write your, uh, let's say D is Cartier, so you write it and assume the variety is normal, which is not uh, in the hypothesis here. So you write it as a veil divisor and then you, you put together all the uh, positive guys and then you subtract all the uh, negative guys. Okay. But this has no reason to be a Cartier in general. So one way to uh, solve this uh, little problem is to use uh, Sears uh, theorem. So the right way to prove this is to take, so you take D, and then uh, since H, so I'll denote by H the, res so, sorry, X is projective, so it's, you can embed it in some uh, protective space. You have the hyperplane here and you restrict it to, a, to X. So H on X is ample. Okay, so now uh, take your uh, Cartier divisor D and apply the definition of ampleness to F equals OX of D. Okay, so what you get is that D plus MH is globally generated for M large enough, okay, by definition of ampleness for H. If it is globally generated, it means that uh, at every point, there's a section that does not vanish. So in particular, there is a non-zero section. Okay. So and uh, if you remember what I did last time, having a non-zero section means that there is an effective divisor, Cartier divisor, which is linearly equivalent to this. Here. effective. Well, once you have this, then, uh, so H, of course, uh, is effective. It's a hyperplane, so MH is effective also, and so you have what you want. Uh, so this is actually, mm, um, Mm. This is linearly oh, this is linearly equivalent, yeah? Well linearly equivalent, yeah. Linearly equivalent, sorry. Okay. So uh, let me skip uh, a whole lot more. Another, uh, another theorem of Serre is a cohomological uh, characterization of uh, ample divisors. So second theorem. So it's the following. So X is a projective case scheme. And D is a Cartier divisor. <coughs> then D is ample if and only if uh, for all coherent sheaves F on X, you have uh, the vanishing of the cohomology group uh, F 
of MD for all M, let's say for all positive Q and all M large enough. So this is a cohomological characterization uh, of ample devices. And uh, so let me give uh, an example of uh, application of the theorem, which uh, would be uh, very useful. So Corey. So uh, assume that x, uh, y, and x are uh, x and y. Sorry, are projective schemes, k schemes. And uh, that you have a, a morphism from x to y with finite fibers. So it is actually finite in the sense of uh, in the usual sense. And uh, so take A, an ample Q divisor on Y. Then the pullback is also ample. On X. So the pullback of a, a divisor by a finite morphism is uh, still ample. So let me try to, uh, to prove this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use the uh, characterization of uh, a cohomological characterization of uh, ample divisors. So we want to check that uh, HQ of X, uh, F, of uh, M psi upper star of A, <coughs> we want to uh, prove that this vanishes for uh, all positive Q and all M large enough. So uh, uh, this, uh, uh, by the, for example, the rest uh, uh, spectral sequence, the fact that phi is uh, finite, therefore affine, uh, tells you that this is isomorphic to some cohomology uh, on Y. And what is it? It is a psi lower star of F of MA. Okay, so this is because F uh, psi is finite. And uh, so, of course, since I'm not proving this, this is sort of a cheat because once you've written this, this is obvious. Now, uh, also, may maybe I should mention that this is also a coherent sheaf on uh, Y, but this is easy to see. And now you just have to uh, apply uh, this criterion here on Y to A. Okay, so this is coherent. So this will be zero by the uh, theorem for all positive Q and M large enough. Okay, so uh, there are a uh, lot more proofs in the notes. Uh, if you've never seen that before, uh, I encourage you to uh, look them up. It's not very difficult. So remember, uh, the reason why uh, I claim that uh, these ample uh, devices would be interesting, is that in particular, so I just erased the definition, but if A is ample, by definition, it implies that MA is globally generated for all M large enough. So in particular, according to the correspondence that I explained at the beginning, uh, this, uh, the divisor uh, being globally generated will define a morphism psi ma, why not, from x to some 
a large projective space, I mean large or not, but some, to some projective space. And uh, so it, we'll see in a moment that this morphism is actually, uh, so you can prove, I, I won't prove it, but uh, that it is actually uh, an embedding for M large enough, but it's quite easy to see that it is a finite. Okay, so for that I want to discuss a little bit what are ample divisors on curves. I mean, I could do it uh, quite easily, but uh, it will fit better once. Okay, so for me, as uh, last time, a, a curve would be a smooth projective curve. But I'll still call it, call it X, not C. So, uh, as we saw now uh, several times, we have uh, the genus of the curve, which can be defined at the uh, dimension of uh, H1. And uh, there is uh, also something which I, I which I want to explain because it's uh, So it's been used also in the other lectures, of course. When you deal with curves, you cannot avoid the riemann rock theorem. So let me explain how the riemann rock. So X, uh, as before, for so any divisor D on X, one has, so I don't think I've, I've defined, uh, so this is the Euler characteristic, so, so in our case, since, so it's the alternate sum of the dimensions of the cohomology groups, and since we are on a curve, there are only two of them, so this is not the theorem, this is the definition, right? Uh, this is uh, the degree of D, plus one minus uh, g of x, the genus. So let me prove that. It's actually a scheme of proof that, that's very uh, useful in higher dimensions, even if I won't have time to do it. So we'll, uh, we will write d as the difference <coughs> of two effective divisors. And uh, so I explained last time that if you have an effective uh, Cartier divisor, you can view it as a subscheme of, of uh, X. So here we can view E and F as just uh, subschemes of X supported on a finite set. Okay. So I'll write the two uh, uh, following uh, magic sequences. I think I forgot last time to explain that, uh, I mean, uh, most of these exact sequences will come from the, uh, whenever you have a Cartier divisor D, an effective Cartier divisor D on X that you, that, uh, you view as a subscheme, there is this exact sequence. So this is the idle sheaf of D, and this is, uh, okay, so this is sort of the, uh, this is always true, okay? Not, not only on a curve, but uh, always. And this is this one here for F twisted by O of E, okay? I could write here O F of E, but they're isomorphic because the F is affine, actually. And uh, let me write the Another one of the same type. Okay, so now this is the, this exact sequence for E, also tensored by OX of E. And now I just uh, write uh, 
the, use the additivity of, of uh, Euler characteristic, and I obtain from the first line chi of, uh, so this is D. Okay. So chi of XD is equal to chi of XE minus chi of, um, yes, uh, of uh, OF. And uh, using the, the second uh, exact sequence, I replace this with the chi of x of x uh, plus chi of e o e minus chi of f o f. But this is a zero dimensional scheme, so there is only one cohomology group, h naught. Okay, so I can replace these chi's by h naught. And remember that I the way I defined the degree of a uh, divisor was uh, exactly like this. So this is just degree of E. This is degree of F. So this difference here is, is the degree of D. And uh, this is just, uh, so my curve is connected. I probably have, I forgot to uh, mention it. So this is H0 of OX is 1. And this is 1 minus the H1, which is the genus. So this is how uh, you obtain this. Yes? Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, it's true because f is zero dimensional. Yes, yes. This is considered as a zero dimensional scheme. Yeah, otherwise this, it's not true. Of yeah, this is true only for, because we are on the curve, so therefore f is a, a finite um, zero, I mean, it's a zero dimensional scheme. Okay, so now let me uh, draw a corollary. A divisor, a Q divisor, D on X is ample if and only if its degree is positive. So, uh, it's not that easy to prove. There is one direction which is uh, quite easy, and I'll do the easy direction and leave you the hard direction. But it's in the notes again. I'll just sketch the, uh, the converse. So, proof. So assume that uh, uh, D, my divisor, assume D is ample. So in particular, uh, using the definition of uh, ampleness, we can say that uh, MD minus X, so let's say that X is any close point. MD minus X will be uh, globally generated for, for M large enough. So in particular, it's a trick that I already used uh, uh, before, it will have a non-zero <coughs> section, meaning that it will be linearly equivalent to uh, effective divisor. So in particular, its degree is non-negative. So this, the point here has a positive degree, so this implies that the, the degree of D is positive. So this is, this is uh, uh, trivial. This is, I mean, this is, uh, follows from the definition. The converse is a little bit uh, harder, and it uses riemann roth Okay, so what we're going to do here uh, is use Riemann Rock not with D because it doesn't tell you so much, but with uh, multiples of D. Okay? So Riemann Rock tells you that uh, the Euler characteristic of MD, so if you replace D with MD, you'll have a uh, polynomial of degree 1 in M, and the uh, leading coefficient is positive, so it will be positive for M very large. 
And since this is the H0 minus H1, it will tell you that uh, MD will have uh, sections. Okay? So at least So since uh, so one of the properties of uh, ampleness was that D is ample if and only if MD is ample, I can replace D with MD, and I can also assume that D is effective. Okay. So we may assume. OK, so, and, uh, so then now you want to prove more. Okay? You want to prove that uh, actually D is, is globally generated. And, uh, so there is a very nice trick. Actually, the whole theory here is filled with very nice tricks. It's too bad because I, I, I don't do any of them, but. Uh. Sorry, we're assuming D is effective because MD is effective? Yeah, uh, I explain orally that I'm, I'm replacing D with MD. OK? So. Uh, upon uh, replacing D with MD again, we can assume that D is globally generated. This is, this is trick. I mean, it's a one-line trick, but still. Once D is globally generated, uh, you know that it uh, induces uh, a map from X to some uh, projective space. Okay? And uh, so... Um, let me, um, well, yeah, I mean, we're, uh, so x is a curve, and so this map is non-constant, it's uh, easy to check, and uh, so therefore, uh, it has finite fibers. Okay, because x is a curve, so either this map is constant, or uh, fibers can, uh, can only be finite. Uh, and uh, so, by definition, D is the pullback. It's linearly equivalent to the pullback of a uh, hyperplane here. So this is ample. Therefore, D is ample. Because it's the pullback of an ample divisor by uh, a, morphism, a morphism with finite fibers. So, um, Okay, so let me uh, finish with uh, some uh, definitions. So let me go back to uh, a general case. So general case here may be uh, just protective writing. <coughs> over some field K, and I take uh, D uh, Cartier divisor. And assume that you have a curve. Excuse me. Yes? Yeah, the finite fibers is weaker than the finite morphism. Uh, here, uh, everything is projective, so it's equivalent. So assume you have a curve, so my convention that C is a smooth projective, and this map is, assume that it's non-constant, therefore finite. So now if D is ample, its pullback would also be ample because rho is finite, and therefore its degree is positive. This is by the easy part of the, uh, of the uh, theorem over there. And this, is, this was by definition the intersection number of D with C. So if you have an ample divisor, its intersection with all curves on X is positive. Unfortunately, the converse is not true. And, uh, but this also uh, suggests that you may relax a little bit 
this definition, I mean, this property here by requiring D to be just to have a non-negative intersection with any curve. So this is a, a new concept, so it's a new definition. We say that in this situation here, uh, D is nef, numerically effective, if DC is non-negative for any curve. on uh, any curve C on X. So uh, ample implies NEF, but not conversely. So by its very definition, uh, being NEF is a is a, what we call a numerical property. It only depends on the numerical equivalence class of D, okay? So you may talk about uh, NEF classes in the neuron cellular group. And uh, you can also define NEF, actually I didn't uh, say what it was here, but uh, I, this definition makes sense for a Q divisor, right? So you, have, you can look at the set of NEF classes in the Q, uh, finitely dimension, finite dimensional uh, Q vector space, uh, this one here. And uh, since we'll have to do a lot of uh, geometry, uh, you can also look at it at in the uh, real vector space where you tensor everything with R, okay? So this is a cone, it's called a NEF cone. So a cone in the sense that uh, if you have a, a, a class alpha NEF and T non-negative, then T alpha is NEF. Okay. Uh, Okay, so I wanted, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll need to do some uh, examples uh, next time. Uh, so what, what we're going to do uh, next is uh, look at ample classes in this uh, thing in here. So here I could look at the uh, ample classes, except there are uh, some problems to be solved first. Uh, by definition, this, is, this really is a numerical property of a divisor, okay? Ampleness, we don't know that yet. It is, but we don't know that yet. Remember that I told you that, so imposing this, which would be, uh, we could think that this is, this is by definition numerical, okay? But this is not equivalent to ampleness, so it, there's uh, um, subtle things going on here which I'll explain uh, in the next lectures. I'll stop here, thank you.